Cause it's a bittersweet symphony this life. Try to make ends meet. You're a slave to money, then you die. Subterraneans, we are pleased this week to present Maya Lane, Artistic Director of Bay Area and Beyond Dance Theater Group, Foo Foo Ha. Hello, Maya. Welcome. Hello, Sarah. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be speaking to you. So let's, you are a busy lady and you are always up to some kind of mischief. So I want to get right into this. My first question for you, how did you realize, when did you realize that you were going to be an artist? At what point in your life did you have that moment, if there was that specific moment? Well, I, I came from a very artistic family. My mom's side of the family were all musicians and visual artists. My mom was a cellist. My dad was a poet and always championed creative expression. So I, I think I was always surrounded by a lot of music and people that were interested in that and I but you know specifically for my own journey I remember I went to I was in Israel and I was five years old and um, every year they would have this uh, Eurovision um, song competition yes and <laughs> I love that's those. actually where ABBA comes from and you know, just seeing the performers with all of the costumes and the backup dancers and, like, the whole show unfold and the audience and the whole experience, I remember looking at my mom and saying, I want to do that. I want to be up there. <laughs> and my mom was really excited about that. She got me into dance classes right away. And, um, yeah, she would take me to see various kinds of shows, and every time I would go home and visualize all the different dances that I wanted to do. And the party that I would have, I would stage performances <laughs> with a handful of friends that I had. And, yeah. So I know that when you were when you were a young girl and, and early adult, that you were very much into ballet and you've been classically trained. Um, you definitely have your proficient in the high arts. And um, you went to UC Irvine for dance and you were a Fulbright scholar as well. And you studied in... Uh, it was Arnhem. Arnhem in the Netherlands. Yeah, the border of Germany. Yeah. And um, I know that that was sort of where you were planting the seeds of Fu Fu Ha, your signature group, your group. How would you say this has changed since then, in terms of aesthetic or ideas, since you became a psychologist? I guess. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that um, originally, uh, I, when I was in Europe, um, I really was affected by the European um, kind of street theater and the, you know, the various forms of um, kind of improvisational theater and busking and all that. And so that, I think that was the first, the initial desire was to take my dance training and mix it with some of the more theatrical characters and, and, and have that be, you know, like a playful group that performs and does, you know, fun, fun little acts. And then, you know, I think the beauty of... Fufu Ha is that it really, you know, since it is all about the individuals and the characters, it, it, it changed with every flock that would come in, right? So <laughs> yeah. All these different, you know, the initial flock versus, like, you know, five years later, you know, new aesthetics and new styles and new colors and new visions came in. And, and then, like, you know, a few years later, like, a whole other flock and then people interested in doing a full show. And the theme of that show is always, for me, I think maybe part of the reason I've always wanted to be a therapist is that I've always been interested in the individual stories of each person. Yes. And that's one thing that I, you know, I think gravitated for me to become a therapist is what is, what is unique to you? What makes you, you, what is your story and how do we celebrate that? So uh, the shows that I was always interested in was, you know, each person and their narrative, what they're struggling with or what they're aspiring to be would be, you know, the kind of vehicle of what the show would be. So I would say that the more confident 
and the more training that I had within doing my own therapy and my own practice, I think the depth of the way that I was working with people in Fu also evolved. Um, the trainings that I started doing, which is more somatic, body-centered, bringing in you know consciousness and spirit and all that that I've done in my therapy world, allowed for me not only to, to work with people in Fu on a deeper level, but also just to represent that theatrically on different levels where we can see, you know, like, you know the union uh, kind of tra transformative process of the self and the alchemy from one part of yourself into a higher part um, was something that you know, I didn't have the experience or the languaging for in the beginning and through my training and experience as a therapist, I was able to translate that more into my theater. And now, working on a, a show that is really going to look at sacred clowning and the trickster and how, you know, the laughter is you know, really used in a lot of rituals as a binding force and as a release force for people to, to come together and that, you know, the community is able to have people go through all these transformations when they're in distress. Mm. And I'm really wanting to work on not just the individual story, but more of the, the communal story of what happens in a group when we're all putting our attention towards playfulness, connection, release, and all that. So it's constantly evolving as I'm evolving not only in my work, but also just as a, a person, a woman in the world. A woe man, a which woe is the man name of your amazing world. show. <laughs> so I was really pleased and immersed, I guess, in your production of Woe Man because I did notice that you had brought your two worlds together. You brought your artistic life with the Jungian psychological elements, and it brought so much depth and layer to your shows. And I wanted to ask you as well, um, from a therapist uh, point of view, how important do you think the element of play is in people's lives? And I don't just mean going to see f fun shows, but I mean in people's personal lives as well. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, well, I think that that's one thing that I've always been grateful that I've had the experience to, to have as part of my life is, you know, with dance, I think there's there's always that element of play because your play is very much being in the moment and um, being creative and not getting stuck with conventions and limitations of what you should be doing, but it allows for you to have more leverage with, you know, how you want to appear, how you want to sound, what you want to do. Um, there, there's a, a wider spectrum of, of choices around what's available to you, and that, you know, definitely shows up in the realm of clown, the realm of performance. It definitely shows up in, you know, the day-to-day -day and the psyche, you know, like the, the sense of play allows for you know like on the day-to-day -to, -day to make choices that are not just well this is my habituated pattern of behavior but mm -hmm. more of this in the moment sense of oh if i was in a play mode right now what are some things that i could try out layers not to simplify it all but the sense of play you know allows for taking risks the comfort in trying something new and the you know the comfort in allowing some levity to, to enter into the relationship and, and to not have it mean such heavy thing. Maybe there's an element of shame a little bit too, an inhibition in people to want to want to be more playful, but they're afraid for whatever reason. Do you think that's yeah. true? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that we all carry so much shame, especially around sexuality. I mean, that, I think that's just kind of various institutions yeah. that you know like inhibition is definitely it comes up when we don't feel safe when uh, we don't feel safe to show ourselves and um and to communicate we don't feel that we're going to be received in a way that's healthy you know unfortunately a lot of us haven't been received in healthy ways and so it develops those layers what Jung did was he he brought in the what he called the numinous realm of, you know the the realm of spirit and the realm of the sacred and the the realm of um, kind of the unknown as also being a really important part of you know the the transformation of the self, and that always intrigued me. 
you know, that this, and he really liked to bring in the sense of al- the alchemical process of going from lead into gold. And, you know, he also saw gold as your golden self, as your highest self, your, your biggest self, your most celebrated self. And there was, you know, a lot that I was playing with the show that I did, but I think that those really spoke to me, you know, the sense of self-mastery, not only through thinking, but also through experiencing through, you know, kind of the magical, numinous aspects of transformation that occur that you have to be tapped into in order to to truly have a transformation, in order to truly tap into your highest self. And, and, you know, the, the work with the shadow always fueled a lot of, you know, the work that I've done with Fufu Ha, which is, you know, kind of looking at your, you know, idiosyncratic inadequacies in, in the world of clown and, and you know, celebrating them. But it's also, you know, within the shadow, it's also our biggest selves. It's also, the, you know, the parts of us that are magnificent yes. that we had to put aside in order to socialize. You right. know, at age five, six, seven, eight, you go to school, you can't be, hello, <laughs> you know, like doing like the dances across the, you know, you had to conform. And so that, I, I loved learning about that because I think a lot of us don't know that essence of the, you know, of the union aspect of the shadow, that the golden self is also within the shadow. And that's something that he was always interested in people tapping into. That one thing that I've uh, really grown to love about clowning beyond the, the whimsy is this sense of risk taking. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of there's a lot of health in it. There's you know, it's also a, a, it could be a lonely and isolating place too to take risks and to you know to do things differently because you're always you know <laughs> right. you know outside of the <laughs> the, the social acceptance. Too. Unless you're an artist, in which case you're perfectly fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I wanted to ask you about that because the thing that I noticed when I watched your shows is that the audience comes in not really knowing necessarily what to expect and as the show unfolds and we're seeing these beautiful um very uh fluid artistic i almost want to say um sexy clowns um and just interesting layers of personalities and character on stage i notice that the audience starts to realize that they that your players are giving them permission to play as well And what I've noticed in the times that I've seen your shows in the last few years is that the audience comes out of the show in this super feisty mood that they were not in before. (laughs) And so that's why I wanted to talk to you about the element of play and, you know, how important that is to you because, to me, your work um, is giving permission for people to play. And that's huge. Definitely. Um, so there's something I want to ask you about, you know, I, full disclosure, I've known you now for 20 years and, um, and I've watched your work grow and we've done work together for, you know, all this time. And I remember you saying to me once when we were much younger, you said, I yearn for that group of people. I see people wandering, creating these beautiful things, and they're always together, and they're committed to this. I really want that. And I remember thinking, like, oh, you will have it. So I know that you you have attained, you made that dream come true for yourself. You have a family, you have children and a husband, too, since then. But um, what was that moment, uh, what were the, the moments over the course of the last decade, I guess, when you finally realized that you did indeed have your magical union, your group of people? Well, you know, it's been a really intriguing journey. Um, I think that Fufu Ha, for you know, reasons that you were just naming, it's been something that people have really enjoyed for a very long time. And, you know, and I think that I was going through a lot of different stages in my life, you know, becoming a new mother, becoming a therapist, becoming pregnant again, my career developing, you know, I think that I wasn't able to truly land in the, the, in the sense of tribe until I was able to land in myself as having a community and being seen in the community. And that's yeah. something that definitely 
has developed, you know, over the last, only the last couple of years, even though I've been doing this for almost 18 years, I wasn't able to really grasp that, and I wasn't able to grasp the importance, not only of the art, but of the community. I'm starting to see more and more of, now that we're branching out, we have a crew in New York, I look at, you know, rehearsal videos, and I look at their little selfies and all that, and they're all having so much fun together, yes. and they love each other so much, yeah. and they're just having such a blast, and like <laughs> telling me this is so fun, and I see them all, like, you know, going out together and doing all this stuff, and, and then now we recently had an audition in Portland, and we had a lot of people show up for the audition, and we got a dozen people, and, you know, a couple of them reached out to me and said, oh my god, this is such a beautiful family. Thank you for inviting me into this, and I'm, I'm acknowledging that, and I, you know, I'm kind of like at the next stage of it, like I, I have it, but now it's about having other people have those tribes, you know, yes. like this is like a vehicle for like other little families to start spreading, and this is really about the connection and belonging that everybody else is getting, so that's when it really kind of hit me that this isn't just cool costumes and glitter <laughs> community experience <laughs> yeah is really really important for people and i feel honored to be a part of that and to facilitate that so it's true um i feel like part of the reason why i've always been attracted to art and especially the performing arts is that it's it's not really about the show on stage, even though that is exhilarating and fun, because that's when you're taking the most risks. You know that at any moment, anything crazy could happen, and there's hundreds, maybe a dozen, or maybe two people watching you, but either way, you know, that's exhilarating. Um, but it's really more about the process, the, like you said, the rehearsals, the going out together, the getting to know each other, like becoming this family, because for every hour that people see you on stage, there's months, weeks, so much time before that when you were building something together. And it seems that artists are not just attracted to it just to be on stage, right? It's because they really want what you were saying before, that they yearn for that family. So tell us more about what you have in the works, a little bit about the show that you mentioned earlier that you've been working on. What can we expect to see from you in the next month, year? What's going on? <laughs> Uh, traveling around and yes. helping foos uh, become a virus all over the world, which is really <laughs> exciting. And so that's one thing that's really fun. And just um, we're starting a Patreon account uh, on May Day. Actually, that's my goal. So that's one thing that we're launching. We have a really fun um, annual show at Electric Forest, which is a really sweet. Um, festival in Michigan and we have a chapel that we do like these really fun interactive shows and before that we are going to have a showing of that show at the Circus Center which has been generously offering us a residency to work in their theater in exchange for us um, putting on the show and the proceeds go to the Circus Center which is a, an important cause. Yes, indeed. Um, so we're going to do that in June. So we'll have our you know local folks be able to see what we're working on. And then there's always new projects and things that are in the works. But um, right now, I think my main priorities are getting more of that infrastructure for the engine um, that really, again, focuses on the community that this, um, this art form is, is offering. So... It's amazing how you started with, you know, four people dressed in striped tights and tutus. <laughs> and you were one of them. <laughs> yes. And, and now you have, like, a network across the country and possibly internationally very soon. I love this idea of working with Patreon to, um, to support the branches of Fufuha that you have going nationally. What are the things that you hope to achieve with that funding? I'm sure you have a wish list of sorts um, that you would yes. like to check off. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about that? Well... You know, our, our, our goal is to just have a, a constant source of support, financial support for the company. 
Um, so it's not just gig to gig, but it actually has like a platform that is supporting the artists and all that they're doing. Um, some of the goals are definitely project based because we have a co- like three new squads, and so they're starting from square one. So they need you know costume material, they need wigs, but there's also you know the maintenance of it, which is the rehearsal space, which is also the administrators that are putting a lot of energy into coordinating things and from websites to you know, design, etc. So there's the actual team that's you know really working hard on all of that. And then on a, on a you know kind of a higher vision, I want to be able to offer like a really meager stipend for you know each troop has a core group of about ten performers and you know if we're able to give them you know anywhere between like 50 to 100 dollars a month which is nothing um to you know gas money you know just yeah, yeah, to right. rehearsals you know like things like that you know it sounds like a small amount but when you have 10 performers in each troop that becomes a big number i want to be able to support the people that are investing so that's that's like a higher vision um and then beyond that there's different projects that we're interested in facilitating for instance we have roxanne shahadi who's a painter and she's interested in collaborating with us on making a food churro deck this is something that she's working on and i'm, I'm gonna post some sketches of what she's been working on but something like that to be able to offer her a little bit of money just for materials for that you know and things things like that there's always collaborations that we're interested in um you know engaging in but we've been really limited because it really is based on the gigs that we get and it's also based on you know me funding you know a (laughs) lot of it i have kids and family it's not that easy no i don't want it to be so dependent on me i want it to be essentially funded by the people who appreciate what we do your patrons absolutely patrons yeah And I feel like, you know, people don't realize that ticket sales, you know, are really expensive for theater and dance these days because rent is really expensive for theaters and venues these days. And, um... And even though most of us, we almost always get paid, we're all professional artists technically, but when you add up all the hours of the office work, the production, all that stuff, the admin stuff you were mentioning, the rehearsals, the travel time, artists don't get paid really enough to survive. Um, And that is something that we probably won't be able to change completely. But with platforms like Patreon, it definitely can improve the situation and exactly. give you a chance to get out there and and just tell people who you are and, and bring more people in because the more money you have to do your productions, the bigger audience you're going to generate. So definitely, um, I definitely. think it's wonderful that you're doing that. Yeah, and we're also you know thinking of really fun incentives and gifts. We have um, custom... Fufuha t-shirts that we're offering people at a certain tier. We have original artists that have done sketches of foos, and we're offering um, choose your favorite foo, and then (laughs) you'll get a sketch of them that's autographed. Um, We're also going to offer uh, workshops in the fall and going to start administering um, around um, finding your inner fool. And it's going to be offered for people who are involved in Patreon. After a certain amount, they they have a seat that's guaranteed in the workshop. So there's different things that we're wanting to offer, not only, you know, as like little gifts, but also as ways for people to get involved with what we're doing as part of the community. I think it's so important when you said, you know, the workshop to find your inner fool. It's just, um, again, too, something that's been talked about quite a bit is that our political situation and the level of anxiety that people feel on a day-to-day basis needs to be diffused. Yes. And (laughs) this is... Very important point. Really important. And people oftentimes, they forget to laugh. They, they forget that they have a, there's a sense of humor and it's really important. This has been amazing talking to you about your work. I feel like we could talk probably for two more hours because there's just so much more. But um, <laughs> is there anything else that you would like to say that you would like to share with the world about you, about your work, anything at all? 
what I'd like to say is that the timing of this is just so synchronistic, speaking of the numinous realm, um, <laughs> because I you know, was just invited to be part of a leadership conference and have been doing just really deep work around stepping into my power, but not from you know an arrogant way, but from a way that I'm able to own it so that I can therefore like offer it yes to the world right so it's, it's the sense of this is this is for everybody <laughs> yeah. to benefit from and and so it feels it feels like a new ground it feels like a, a really lovely place to to find myself in and to, to be seen I, I'm definitely someone that's always been hiding I've, I've, you know <laughs> I, that's the reason why I have one-on-one -on -one practice you know it's I, I like to do my own thing and, you know, my persona as Mama Fu is very magnanimous, but, you know, I've, I've definitely had this sense of, I don't throw birthday parties for myself kind of thing. So this <laughs> is me, this is me trying to counter that by actually showing myself and owning what I have to offer to the world. And it feels really lovely. And, um, and so I would say like this interview and be able to offer that while I'm also working on Patreon while I'm also working on more visibility. It just feels like it's all connected and an important time. So. That is so fantastic. I feel really energized just talking to you, to be honest. Maya Lane, just all around amazing lady. Okay. And so Aww, thank you so much. You. And so I much. will make sure that we post all of the links and all the information about you so that everyone can come see you wherever they are in the United thank States. You. Thank you, I'm Maya. Honored. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>I was pulled down from Hollywood, you see, to be a guest celebrity judge on America's Next Best Thing.